welcome to uh, Fiveables Weekly AP Euro Broadcast. And as uh, you know, I've heard recently, it sounds like Fiveables going to be making these uh, public and free um, at least through uh, through mid April. Uh, I'm under the impression, so that's good to hear. Hopefully, we'll get some people showing up for these. Uh, you know, so we've got uh, got a few in here right now, and it looks like we've already got some questions. So we'll get that uh, going. And thank you very much, Emily, for all of your help there, for providing us with some questions, getting us some head starts, and all of that good stuff. Okay, now I uh, just got to warn y'all. I am. I have been under the weather. I'm kind of getting over an illness, but the good news is. <coughs> <coughs> See, I can't get you sick over the internet. So we're good, right? We're good. Everybody, Everybody's good. We're all friends here. So let me go ahead and delve into the questions. Now, the focus area for this session will be the 19th century isms. And so we're looking at the early 19th century, otherwise known as the age of Metternich, 1815 to 1848, that sort of time period. Now, I can take questions from other time periods as time allows. And if we see upvotes, now, when I was in the A-push, uh, session a little while ago, uh, what I saw was uh, there was a question that was outside of the uh, designated uh, topic and time period, but it got a lot of upvotes. And so I answer, I put that question on a higher priority because I saw a lot of people wanted that answered. So remember that we do have our focus area, but our biggest focus at Fiveable is on you. So whatever questions you have, go ahead and send them our way. Okay. Now, first of all, um, Emily, you've got you have several questions here. Uh, she's a lifesaver. She gets these things jump started, uh, you know, like uh, prime in the pump, like John Maynard Keynes. All right. So as far as this goes, first of all, what is the balance of power in Europe? OK, so as far as that goes, the balance of power is really a it's it's a it's the cornerstone of a pragmatic foreign policy. OK, so when you think about what is going to prevent war, what is going to promote stability, there must be multiple powers okay you have to have several great powers and one of them can't be so strong that it can topple over the rest of them okay so that is the idea because when you look through european history whenever one of these countries gets too big and it just gets too big for its britches it starts invading other countries and continental wars ensue and so you saw this uh first of all with uh now in the 30 years war what happened if you think about the way the balance of power worked in the 30 years war is that france ended up intervening in the 30 years war on the side of the protestants because they made a very calculated judgment uh, because the the epicenters of power at that time you know the holy roman empire the habsburg empire was the uh the biggest power in Europe at that time. And so this Bourbon dynasty, this uh, kind of newly minted Bourbon dynasty in France, uh, they're thinking, okay, you know what? It would be more politically advantageous for us to get into an alliance with the Swedes and the German Protestants because they're fighting against the Habsburgs. What they couldn't have happen is the Habsburgs end up winning the Thirty Years' War. And, you know, although it was good for Catholicism, it would have been bad for Europe because there would have been this juggernaut. And so France, now remember, this is what we call politique. It's spelled like politique, uh, P-O-L-I-T-I-Q-U-E, politique. And the politique mindset, it's really not altogether different from Bismarck's real politic, okay? Um, so when you're thinking about politiques, uh, this isn't just about religion, this is about national interest. So when you look at the aftermath of the Thirty Years' War, what you saw there, was that the Holy Roman Empire was weakened, the Habsburg influence in Europe was weakened, um, and then France uh, ended up being kind of the, you know, it's kind of a muddled outcome in the Treaty of Westphalia, but at the same time, France is kind of the, you know, the overall, like, they were much better off after this war than they were before it. Now, then we see that France becomes eventually the biggest threat to the balance of power in Europe. Louis the Fourteenth, okay, France built up the largest, strongest army, and Louis used this to launch aggressive wars. And 
So as far as that, as far as that is concerned, uh, you know, Louis is launching these uh, these aggressive wars against, uh, you know, against the Dutch and, uh, you know, then against, uh, you know, just fighting whoever he can. And then, of course, there's the War of the Spanish Succession. OK, the War of the Spanish Succession. Uh, this was a dynastic war. Now, when you look at European wars before Louis the Fourteenth or through Louis the Fourteenth, they're dynastic wars. What dynasty is going to control this or that? And so, you know, when Charles the Second of Spain died, then you know he says, "Oh, my will and testament says that a Bourbon monarch will take the throne." Well, to the British and the Austrians and Prussians, they're they're not too high on this because what this does is now the Bourbon monarchy, uh, the Bourbon family is in control of the Spanish and the French monarchies, and conceivably they could unite under a you know a common uh, monarchy, kind of like what happened to the United Kingdom, uh, you know, of England and Scotland, that they merged the monarchies, and then next thing you know they merged the countries, and so as far as that goes, at the end of the war of the Spanish succession, uh, you know, Louis, they kind of fought everybody to a draw. He was that powerful. Uh, now, the British, uh, you know, they they are looking forward kind of, okay, because what happens is, you know, the agreement is that there can be a Bourbon monarch in Spain, but the two houses cannot uh, you know, ever merge, okay, that they have to stay separate. Now, Spain still has a bourbon monarch. Uh, France, of course, obviously not. Cha -ching, uh, that sort of thing. And so then, you know, Britain says, you know what, we're going to let this happen. You can have your whole dynastic thing as long as you don't merge them. And Britain said, we want Gibraltar. We want this, uh, you know, this, uh, this little area here <coughs> that's going to give us a commanding naval presence around the Strait of Gibraltar going into the Mediterranean Sea, which of course comes in handy during the Napoleonic Wars, which is the next big challenge to the balance of power. Uh, the Battle of Trafalgar, which, uh, you know, was not too far away from the Straits of Gibraltar. And so with that, you know, after the Napoleonic Wars, it's like, okay, France has become too powerful. France, you know, when you've got a country that is not only the largest country at that time, the most powerful militarily, but also the least stable, okay? So France really failed Europe on two fronts, that it was the most powerful, but then also you have this, uh, you know, this emphasis on liberalism, nationalism, republicanism, and then finally the French empire. And the Congress of Vienna, when it gets together, it's like, okay, we've got to restore the balance of power here, that we've seen a little, uh, we've seen a problem here. We need to restore the balance of power um, so that uh, this is, you know, kind of put into uh, that, that it's kind of put into into perspective. We want to restore it. Now, the thing is, part of the balance of power, and this is something that's important to note, uh, and we talked about this some last year, when we're talking or last week when we were talking about the Congress of Vienna versus, uh, you know, versus the Paris Peace Conference after World War One. And so I'm going to put this on the screen because I know we had a very uh, low turnout last last week with uh, people just getting back to school. And of course, you have people have been getting sick and all of that kind of stuff, too. But as far as that goes, power, since the balance of power was the priority at the Congress of Vienna, the whole thing was that we don't want France to be, you know, we don't want to turn France into some sort of uh, vassal state. We need a powerful France because France is a counterweight uh, and it needs to have, you know, it needs to be powerful. So, you know, where you saw Article 241 and the, uh, you know, in the 14 points and all of that kind of stuff after, uh, you know, World War One, that the German, you know, Article 231 of the Versailles Treaty was about Germany, you are taking responsibility for starting the war and you will pay reparations to the allies. Now, for France, uh, you know, I mean, really, the Treaty of Versailles, it was aimed at weakening Germany and making sure that Germany did not have any war making capacity. Whereas for France, it wasn't about that at all. It's just, OK, France, here are your 1791 borders back. Here are the borders that you had before the French Revolution, before the wars of the French Revolution. And then we're going to put a Bourbon monarch back on the throne. And so the idea here is to restore the balance of power. The best way to 
make sure that there aren't wars is that you have several powerful nations and one nation can't get in its head that, hey, I can go to war and I can beat everybody. OK, so that's what you saw with Louis the 14th, France, Napoleonic France. And what you'll see again in the 20th century with Germany, because Germany becomes that much more powerful than any of the other powers in Europe. And so. So if the folks at the Paris Peace Conference had thought, uh, you know, a little bit more along those lines, that we need a strong Germany, we need to make sure they can't make war, but we don't need to um, completely undermine their, uh, you know, their economic and military clout, then you might not have seen the tragedy of, you know, World War II and the age of dictatorships and all of that kind of stuff. Now, of course, the Congress of Vienna was followed by you could either argue uh, for this, you could argue that the Congress of Vienna was followed by 33 years of peace. Uh, you know, you could say revolutions of 1848, you know, Crimean War a little bit later. But really, I would say that it, I mean, it was almost 100 years before you had another like truly proper continental war, like on the just on the dest destructive level of the Napoleonic Wars. So that's the whole idea of the balance of power is this idea that, you know, you are attempting to, you know, this idea that you're attempting to make sure that things are in balance. And so one side cannot, uh, you know, one country cannot run roughshod over everyone else. Okay. So, uh, and ladies and gentlemen, we've got some of y'all here and I see that y'all upvoted some of uh, Emily's uh, questions here. Feel free to do that. Upvote, ask your own questions. Okay. We've got, looks like Sarah's asked a question. So that's, uh, that's pretty awesome there. Uh, so let's uh, get those questions in. Uh, if if you like a question somebody else asked, upvote. Okay, some of you that are here for the first time, there are all kinds of things you can do here. Now, Sarah, what makes the age of Metternich unique or significant? Uh, I would say that it is that period of stability within states and between states that, you know, Thomas Jefferson, when he was giving one of his inaugural addresses during the Napoleonic Wars, uh, he thanked God that the United States had been separated by a vast ocean from the exterminating havoc exterminating havoc of one quarter of the globe. So when Thomas Jefferson thought of Europe, uh, he thought of an exterminating havoc, okay? And he hadn't even seen the 20th century yet. Now, this exterminating havoc, because the Congress of Vienna is turned into a very, uh, you know, stable continent for a while. Now, of course, uh, you know, it's a it's a repressive continent. You don't see uh, the development of, uh, you know, of democracy uh, to the same extent you're going to see in the United States at the same time. So certainly, uh, you know, it's not, uh, it's not perfect, but it is stable because Europe was always known for its incessant wars uh, before that. So that's something that is, uh, you know, that's that I think is unique and significant that you've got this stability within states, stability between states with a few things here and there, but nothing on a truly continental scale. All right. And so going from uh, going from there. Um, all right. So socialism and marxism okay so let's uh let's chat about that okay so socialism now the first thing that we need to understand and i go into this in my video if y'all haven't seen my video on the uh you know the 19th century isms take a look at that because that's where a lot of what i'm talking about you know comes from that i put this in lecture form um spencer good to see you hey there uh, that, you know, first of all, you've got liberalism on one side. Now, remember liberalism, throw out any kind of notion of the term liberal as you've heard it in the United States, because the, you know, the way that we use the word liberal, it's such a moving target. Uh, when somebody's pressed, I'm not sure that an American could really tell you uh, what it exactly means. What is the philosophy of someone who is a liberal? Now, in the 19th century, it was very clear because uh, you had only one variant of liberalism, you know, known as classical liberalism. Now, this is basically about liberty on all fronts. OK, so economic freedom, laissez-faire, Adam Smith, that there is minimal government intervention in the economy, um, that 
there is equality under the law that that the you get rid of all class privileges. Um, so when Thomas Jefferson wrote, "All men are created equal," all men are created, e and you see in the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen, uh, you know that men are born free and remain free and equal in rights. Okay, so you've got this idea of everyone is equal in rights. Um, everybody's equal in you know human dignity. So we get rid of these uh, class privileges. Of course, liberals favored secularization. Uh, but the biggest thing is that liberalism, which today you would call it conservative conservative liberalism. Uh, you know, which uh, you know, if you want to look, uh, look at the party that has the highest number of uh, seats in the uh, in the Dutch Parliament today. And that's uh, you know that's really that's what you call conservative liberalism. That it's about the individual. Um, so for example example, the Dutch today um, are having, you know, which today, like just in this day and age, they're having a debate because today they've got, uh, you know, they've got laws that, that say that you can have physician assisted suicide, but you have to meet certain criteria. Um, so you have to say like, OK, so, you know, are you terminally ill? Are you in pain? Da, 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 da. Are you in cure? You know, that sort of thing. Now, there's debate in the Netherlands, which uh, the Netherlands has a very rich tradition of liberalism. There's debate. Some parties in the Netherlands favor a, you know, a change in this law uh, because, you know, what they want is to say that above a certain age, anybody can make the choice to end their life, whether they're terminally ill or not. So imagine somebody above the age of 70, 75, 80, that they decide, look, I mean, I've, uh, you know, I've retired, I've raised my kids, I've seen my grandkids, I don't feel very well, I'm in pain, uh, there's really not a whole lot left for me to accomplish in this life, and I'm ready to die. Now, in a country like ours, that's, you know, we've got a lot of people that that uh, aggravates them from a religious perspective. But for the for the Dutch, you know, when, when you think of it from a purely liberal perspective, then a person should be able to make that decision for themselves that I'm ready to end my life from a liberal perspective. Now, from a conservative perspective, not so much, because remember, that's, uh, <clears throat> you know, conservatives, romantics, you know, that's that's up to God. Right. Um, so on one hand, <laughs> liberalism. Now, John Stuart Mill wrote the two maxims of liberalism and on liberty. And what he said here is that, first of all, that if it if it is if it is only his own interest at stake, then a man, uh, you know, a person owes nothing to society and can make their own decisions. Now, when society can intervene is when my actions can be injurious to society. OK, so, for example, like if we think about, uh, you know, laws against like smoking in public places, including restaurants. And well, the thing is that, you know, some people say, um, well, if a restaurant owner wants to allow people to smoke in there, that's their business. But the restaurant's open to the public, which means that it's open to children. And so there is certainly a liberal justification for saying that, well, you know what, there's there's not a, you know, I mean, there there's not, you know, that, that you can say that the government can step in and say, look, secondhand smoke is harmful to children. And, you know, if a place is open to the public, then no, no smoking in this place that's open to the public. And so as far as that, that's liberalism. OK, now that's about the individual. OK. And remember that liberalism says that there is inherently in society a harmony of interests, just like right now. Uh, you know, I'm being uh, you know, I have a contract with Fiveable to deliver these reviews. So I'm getting something out of it. You're clearly here because you think that you're getting something out of it. So everybody's benefiting on an individual level and we're all here. Nobody's making us be here. And so society runs best according to, you know, the liberal theory of Adam Smith, when every individual can pursue their self-interest. Now, <clears throat> enter the socialist, okay? Now, socialists believe that the roots of socialism is that the needs of society should be considered 
before the needs of the individual, okay? And so that's really the big difference between liberalism and socialism is that liberalism is about the individual. Socialism is about the group, okay? It's about the group. And so restrictions can be put on individuals if it's seen that, you know what, they need to be, their energy needs to be harnessed for the group. A liberal would say that basically my obligation is not to hurt the group. If I'm not doing any thing to hurt the group, then I'm fine. For a socialist, you should be doing something to help the group, okay? So the group should be considered first. And a socialist sees, um, you know, selfishness, you know, selfish interest as being detrimental to society. Now, Marxism is a particular type of socialism, okay? So if you imagine socialism, okay? So imagine socialism in this, uh, you know, in this circle, and Marxism is a circle within that circle, okay? So every Marxist is a socialist, but every socialist is not a Marxist. Now, before Marx, uh, you had what was called a utopian socialism. I have trouble remembering those people's names and it's fine, okay? Because you don't need to know their names for uh, for the exam. But the people who came along before Marx, it was utopian socialism. Now, Marx claimed that his socialism, now I might argue that all socialism is utopian, uh, but as far as Marx was concerned, my socialism, he says, is scientific, okay? That he's basically come up with this whole like, you know, dialectic that essentially that history is made up of countless class struggles that, you know, it's this class versus this class, this class versus this class. So basically, you know, the earliest uh, people, you know, they appointed people to lead them because they needed to. And these people accumulate privileges. And then you see as, you know, you go back to ancient Rome, the patricians, and the plebeians, the middle ages, the nobility versus the peasantry. Um, then what uh, what he sees here coming out of the feudal order is this uh, conflict between the rising bourgeoisie, okay, the bourgeoisie, the French uh, middle class, okay, the French middle class, the bourgeoisie. Um, now, remember when I say middle, I'm talking about like upper middle, like professional class, white collar, okay? And so Marx sees the bourgeoisie, these people who own the means of production. Okay. And so what he sees is this guy owns a factory, owns the means of production. He employs all of these workers. Okay. All of these workers, laborers, whatnot. And then he, you know, so then he pays them as little as he can. And then he gets the profit. Now, did he do any of the work? No. I mean, now, and that's really, uh, you know, capitalism started off as a pejorative term coined by socialists. But the whole idea of capitalism is the person who owns uh, the means of production get is entitled to the profits and people who work there, uh, they have wages. OK, now what Marx prophesied, OK, or what he's, uh, you know, that sounds religious, doesn't it? But what he forecasted is that eventually the working class is going to be so fed up with the exploitation of their, you know, of workers that they are going to violently rise up and overthrow the bourgeoisie. And then they will set up. Now, there's one guy that I know that talks about how Marx, uh, Marxism, he says he's all about Marxism looking backwards. Because, you know, when you explain history as a bunch of class struggles, then yes. But then it's like what Marx does is he looks backwards and he sees all of these class struggles. And then he looks forward and then it's like, oh, well, you know what? They're going to overthrow the bourgeoisie and everything's going to be nice. And there's going to be this communist society and everybody's going to be equal and happy and all of that kind of kind of stuff. And it's like, what? Uh, but the thing is, Marxism saw individual interest as being detrimental to the group. And therefore, the workers need to own the means of production and manage things cooperatively. And so just remember, Marxism is a type of socialism. OK, so and socialism describes any system of thinking that puts the uh, that puts the group the perceived needs of the group um uh, you know i guess perceived by the authority figures right um over the uh desires of individuals which if you think about like you know national socialism and fascism which i typically i tend to refer to as 
right wing socialism when I use uh, when I use this term, uh, because when it comes down to it, it is a you know, it's not called national socialism for nothing uh, because it is a form of socialism. Now, the state didn't own the means of production in Nazi Germany necessarily, but the state controlled the means of production. And so it's not so much who owns something as who controls it. And so, you know, when you look at uh, Nazi Germany, people really didn't have any more like autonomy uh, than they had in the Soviet Union. You know, you still could get, you know, somebody just break into your house and take you out there in the middle of the night and you're never heard from again. And so, of course, now, then again, people look to, you know, Marxist. Uh, there are so many variants of Marxism as well um, that they look to the Soviet Union and that sort of thing, Soviet communism, and they say, no, that's not real Marxism. So anyway, that's that. OK. And so what are the best examples of romantics? OK, so literature, art, architecture. OK, now, as far as literature, I typically look at uh, I would typically refer to Frankenstein because that's something that, uh, you know, that kids tend to be familiar with and it's got that whole romantic idea that you know man should not try to play God okay that that man should not try to play God when man tries to play God when man goes too deep into the whole science thing then you know that is a you know that's that's not uh, you know that's not going to end well uh, so as far as that goes, uh, you know, that's that's romanticism. OK, this idea of nature over man. OK, nature over man. And so, you know, that's one. Now, another one I really like is the sorrows of young Werther. Uh, you know, this is one. The sorrows of young Werther is uh, by, you know, what is his name? Is it Goethe, Goethe, whatever? I, I, you know, I need to learn how to say that in German and proper German. Um, but as far as that, uh, far as that goes, um, you know, that, 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 that book, it's about this guy that, uh, you know, he goes out into the countryside and he's like, he goes and grows his own garden, lives in a cabin and it's talking about how beautiful everything is. He like, you know, he strung his own beans and is like, oh, this is so great to get away from like the city and all that. And then he falls in love with this woman. Um, and then, you know, he can't have the woman because she's engaged to someone else. And because he can't have this woman, he's so in love with her. Uh, I never finished the book, but I believe at the end he kills himself. Uh, that's that's what I was told. Uh, so but the thing is, this whole idea that my heart aches for her so much that I would rather die than live without her. And that is a very, very romantic sentiment, even in the sense that we use romantic today. Romantic love is only. Uh, yes, exactly. It's a written test. Excellent. Um, but yeah, but this idea of like, you know, I would rather die than live without her. Um, and so that's uh, that's something that, you know, I think about now as far as romantic art. Uh, now, also literature, William Blake. I like, you know, I like to refer to William Blake's poetry, especially, you know, the dark satanic mills uh, that he writes about, uh, you know, about the Industrial Revolution. So that's, uh, you know, William Blake, uh, Gotha, whatever we'd say that name. It's a written test. Um, and. Uh, then, of course, Frankenstein. Now, as far as art, Casper, Casper, Casper David Friedrich, um, Friedrich, whatever. I've got it on my, um, you know, my romantic art uh, video. Um, but uh, he's got, of course, the man over the the wandering man looking over the sea of fog. OK, so you see a human subject in the middle, but the human subject is not, um, you know, is the human subject. Let me let me go ahead and put some of these on there, because some of y'all may not have talked about this in class. And I want to make sure that we've got that. So uh, Sea of Fog. Wanderer above the Sea of Fog. OK, so when we look at uh, when we look at this, there is a man, but he's facing away. He's not really the subject of the painting that the subject of the painting is really this rich natural landscape. So romantic art, uh, you know, when you're looking at Casper uh, uh, David Friedrich's uh, work um, that, you know, he's painting. Now, of course, when they paint themselves, it's in these ways. This is memeable here. Somebody. Yeah, this this is very, very memeable. I've got to figure out exactly what I want to do with that. Um, you know, so as far as that goes, you see these beautiful uh, landscape uh, paintings here. Um, you know, so the the predominance of nature and natural subjects. 
Um, you know, you see, you see there just an old, uh, you know, and then the ruins of an abbey. Now, this also points to romantics and the way that they were fascinated with religion. And so when you see like, I mean, that's one of the things about romanticism is it's a reaction to the Enlightenment and how the Enlightenment seems to have taken over things. You know, it's like Europe used to be a place of beautiful monasteries and knights and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And, you know, what's, uh, you know, what's going on, uh, what's going on here, you know? And so as far as, uh, as far as that goes, um, that's, uh, that's another one. Um, so Friedrich is definitely somebody that I, that I like, uh, now wait, I thought I saw that. Okay. So did he do this? Oh, two men contemplating the moon. Okay. So he's got two men contemplating the moon there. Um, and then, um, I, I've always seen the uh, the man and the woman contemplating the moon. Um, so you know, but a very similar uh, a very similar painting there. Uh, so at least three versions. Okay, so uh, interesting, interesting. Oh, oh, wow! Like this one is uh, that's one um, one version of this uh, where it's very very dark outside. Uh, you know, and then you see, uh, you see there, yeah, that's just, they're just sitting there contemplating nature and, you know, the enlightenment, what I've said before is, uh, you know, the enlightenment is like, you know, that is a, uh, that is a river there. How can we build a bridge across it? How can we harness its energy to create hydroelectric power? Uh, whereas a romantic looks at the river and says, look at that river. It's so beautiful. Uh, you know, look at that river. How can we protect it, um, you know, and keep its natural beauty out there? Um, as far as architecture, uh, now, uh, now another one for art um, is Turner, um, J.M.W. Turner. Um, you know, he's someone, let's see, Turner... Yeah, let me let me go back to uh, let me go back to sharing um, again here. Um, so, there we go. All right. So, uh, J. M. W. Turner, the slave ship. Now, the thing is, um, slavers throwing overboard dead and dying typhoon coming on. Now, one thing that you see here is this whole idea, like there's kind of a subtext here that slavery, of course, is a great uh, injustice. This is, uh, was painted during the 1840s where you had a very, uh, you know, painted 1840, uh, where you've got, uh, you know, an abolition movement going on in, uh, in Britain to end the slave trade. And then here it's like this idea that man has his idea that I'm going to go buy people and sell them for profit. And then God has his idea that I'm going to send a big old storm and we're going to see how your plans add up. Uh, you know, so that's something that, you know, just has this, uh, this whole kind of romantic subtext uh, as well. Um, but J.M.W. Turner, who painted like, I mean, he was prolific. I tell you, if I get a video production schedule, uh, you know, he's got uh, 550 oil paintings, 2,000 watercolors. Uh, you know, I mean, it's just this guy was so prolific. I'm just, I'm jealous of how, you know, inspired uh, this guy could be on a regular, uh, on a regular basis. Uh, and so you see here, there are human subjects there, but remember that it's really the nature and the nature, you know, the natural landscape there that is really the focal point of this. Now for architecture, I wouldn't so much get into, uh, get in names there as much as neo-Gothic, okay? Uh, now remember that romantics, they liked the Middle Ages. Uh, so the thing is, it makes sense that the whole idea, and remember the stuff that the enlightened people don't like, you know, they don't like the Middle Ages, they don't like uh, Christianity, uh, whereas the neo-Gothic architecture is like, you know what, we want to build like buildings that look like medieval cathedrals. Uh, and so that, if you could connect neo-Gothic architecture to this, then I think, uh, I think you're good there. All right. Now, I do think, see, Emily, one thing, and I think this is a discussion, not so much for the AP exam only, but 
I think that this is a good discussion just for um, current events, okay? Because, uh, you know, Emmanuel Macron uh, in his Armistice Day speech, you know, just slammed nationalism as a cause for World War One, and like, you know, we don't need nationalism in today's world. It's destructive, da, 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 da. Um, now, the thing is, he talks, you know, it's like, okay, so Germans invading France, like, OK, they're driven by nationalism. But a counterpoint that I read somebody's, you know, a speech that someone gave um, in response to what Macron had said. And he said, but what about these French patriots who were, you know, standing in the trenches? You know, they were manning the trenches and they were fighting for their country. So when it comes down to it, uh, you know, when Macron is slamming nationalism, it's like those people uh, that he was commemorating. It's like those were French nationalists. Like nationalism has a very like strong root in France, because remember that part of that was, I mean, nationalism can be a very good thing if it unites people. OK, so when it comes down to it, like French nationalists at the time of the French Revolution, you see the three estates. OK, um, the first second, third estate. The French nationalists, the National Assembly. We want just one nation of people who are considering the common good, okay? Um, now, of course, you know, you see some of these, uh, you know, subsets, like even today, people talk about white nationalism. And the thing is, in the United States, white nationalism cannot really be a nationalism because the country is too diverse uh, for that, okay? That like, you know, 30% of this country or more, uh, you know, is non-white. So to say that, you know, somebody says that they're a white nationalist, it's like, well, you can't really do that because it's not bringing the whole nation together. Um, so a true nationalism has to do that. Now, Napoleon, I found his, uh, you know, I want to do a video on his Concordat at some point. And I think in the Concordat, you've got really an example of, enlightened nationalism, uh, you know, where, you know, Napoleon saying that Catholicism is the majority religion of France, but we also recognize that there are religious minorities in this country and they deserve protection as well. So, you know, from Napoleon's standpoint, Protestants and Jews, these are people who are part of our nation that deserve the protection of our nation. Whereas if you look at, you know, national socialism, where, uh, you know, the Jews, uh, these people are apart from our nation and they don't deserve to be considered part of the nation. Now, another thing is, you know, it's, it's like, you know, it, I mean, there's, I, I get into like Star Wars nerd, nerd them a lot. And the thing is that, the light side and the dark side of the force. Okay. There, there are some, uh, some Jedi, like when you start like reading the books and the, all that kind of stuff, uh, there are some Jedi who they, uh, they actually don't believe that the force has a light side and the dark side, that there are only light, you know, there are only light and dark people that if the force is channeled by a person. OK, OK, you know what I'm talking about here. OK, so uh, th wow, that's uh, Emily. You just uh, scored some points there. Um, so so the thing is, as far as that goes, like I've got, uh, you know, I've got my, you know, Revan, uh, you know, Re Revan over there. And the thing is that. Of course, that's from his dark side days. But, uh, you know, I can't find a light Revan, uh, you know, that looks that cool. Uh, but the thing is that it's just, you know, if the, uh, you know, if the force is, uh, you know, is something that people channel. OK, I see nationalism as the same sort of thing. Like nationalism is an effort to unite people, uh, you know, across, uh, you know, with, you know, that speak the same language, that share a common culture and all of that uh, kind of stuff. I tell you, it makes me want to watch the Rebels season two finale again. I've, I've probably watched that like 30 times, uh, not even exaggerating. Uh, but uh, but as far as uh, as far as as that goes, uh, you know, in Germany and in Italy, nationalism is something that united people across boundaries. So it's like, why are we separated by national boundaries, um, you know, from these people who we share a common language and we share elements of culture? Now, of course, uh, when you look at something like uh, the Austrian Empire, and this brings us into one of the things that, uh, you know, somebody else has asked about that I'll get to in a second. But in the Austrian Empire, where you've got no less than 10 distinct nationalities, if nationalism 
racism gets in there. And that's kind of like, you know, when I talk about like in the United States, you've got people talking, you know, whether people are, you know, people talk about different kinds of racial nationalisms. It's not really compatible with a diverse country like ours. So for it to work, it has to be something different. But in the Austrian Empire, it's like, you know, that's what pretty much blew that up because you had all of these different ethnic groups under the dominion of Germans. And this will also go into what you were talking about as a, uh, you know, as a nation state. Um, yeah. Now, the, and the thing is as well that, uh, you know, Greece is, uh, you know, Greece, of course, uh, for them, they're separating from the Ottoman Empire, but also, you know, nationalism has kind of given them some, some national pride again. Now, Belgium is, uh, you know, quite a curious uh, case. Uh, there's a there's an interesting video that I was watching by History with Hilbert. Um, now, another thing is if you've never seen Nigel Farage in the European Parliament talk about Belgium, it's it's just it's hilarious because Belgium, you know, has a little bit of a problem because they don't have a common language and they don't have like a you know, there's not really a majority um, in that country that you've got two distinct groups of people, um, you know, in Belgium. And that's why Nigel Farage refers to uh, Nigel Farage refers to uh, Belgium as a non-country, as he calls it, uh, you know, because it doesn't have that basic, uh, you know, glue that's holding it together. So let me go ahead and activate uh, Emily's other question. Yeah. So the definition of a nation state. OK, so Belgium is a state, but Belgium is not really a nation per se, okay? Because when it comes down to it, uh, a nation has to have a common language. Now, not everybody in the United States sp speaks English. Not everybody in France speaks French. But if you don't speak that language, your possibilities for advancement are very limited. For example, you know, when we're preparing for AP exams, uh, you know, it's uh, the essay, ha the test is in English. The essay has to be written in English. If you want to be certified as a teacher, you have to be able to uh, write and speak intelligently in English. So a nation state um, is a, you know, when you think about like the Austrian Empire, not a nation state, okay, because it's not um, a national group. So when we talk about a nation, it has to have like there is the state, which is the political community. And then there is the idea of the people, okay? So when it comes down to it, if the people that are, you know, if the, if the people who are living in that political community also see themselves as a coherent national group, then that is a nation state, which when we think about France, France before the French Revolution, where you had all of these, you know, regional dialects and languages, you know, where there are some parts of France where France, French wasn't uh, the, comp, the dominant language that was spoken. Um, and so as far as that goes, and then all of these regional laws, so the Napoleonic Code made a nation of France, okay? That's why, you know, I think, uh, you know, I've come to think that Napoleon was much more a completer of the French Revolution than a compromiser, because I think one of the major, uh, you know, the major themes of the French Revolution is nationalism. So when Napoleon says, here's the Napoleonic Code, this is going to be a code of laws for the whole nation and everyone equal under the law, then there is a nation. When Napoleon says that, you know, Catholicism is our majority religion, uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, other people have religions too, and that's cool. Uh, that is a, a sort of nationalism. Uh, you know, when uh, during the reign of terror, they try to de-Christianize, well, you, you're not going to build nationalism by persecuting the majority religion in the country. Um, and so as far as that sort of thing that the nation state, so Greece, nation state, okay, because these people are united by a common language and by a common sense of community um, that you don't see in the Austrian Empire. And so that's, you know, Italy being a, you know, a nation state, okay, so it's not just a state, uh, it is also a nation. Hopefully I answered that question uh, well enough uh, there. All right, there was another question here. Okay, so let's see, uh, Giselle, did conservatism have a greater impact on the Congress of Vienna than other isms? Yes, it very much did. OK, because that was the point was to reestablish a conservative order. Now, when we look at the French Revolution, liberalism, 
and nationalism. And liberalism and nationalism both can be very destabilizing. So we see in the 19th century where, you know, the European map changes quite a bit because of the influence of nationalism. Uh, and then, of course, liberalism is compromising the inherited privileges of the aristocratic, uh, you know, the aristocratic portion of society. And so, of course, uh, Metternich is, uh, you know, wanting to reestablish those privileges because the thing is, is those privileges, they make things stable, okay, that it's tradition. We have these traditional institutions. And so in the eyes of the aristocracy, uh, and in the eyes of a lot of, a lot of people, Edmund Burke, who criticized the French Revolution, uh, but in the eyes of conservatives, the French, they undermine their institutions very quickly. Whereas when you look at the British, if you look at the glorious revolution, uh, then what you're looking at is just a redistribution of power between two institutions that already exist existed, the monarchy and the parliament. There had already been a parliament. There had already been a monarchy. So they are shifting the balance between the two of them in favor of the parliament, whereas previously to the Stuarts, it had been in the hands of the monarchy. And so, yes, that is very intentional that conservatism was the dominant influence of the Congress of Vienna. All right. And so as far as that goes now, uh, now, Emily, if you haven't seen my series on uh, the on women and the French Revolution, I'd strongly urge you to take a look at that. Uh, you know, one of my favorites is Olympe de Gouge. OK, Olympe de Gouge, um, who wrote the Declaration for the uh, Declaration of the Rights of Woman and the Female Citizen, um, that she was, uh, you know, that she's basically saying that, like, look, that the way that things are now, that that essentially, uh, you know, she's pointing out a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of things that really don't make any sense. Like, for example, if a woman who is married gets impregnated by another man, then her husband is still, you know, he's still expected to acknowledge that child and to raise it. OK, whereas if, uh, you know, that same man like this nobleman knocks up, uh, you know, a serving girl, then she's basically subject to hit. She's at the mercy of the kindness of his heart. So there were a lot of uh, people, you know, y'all watch uh, Game of Thrones, even though there's kind of a twist there. But, uh, you know, but actually we do see that in a lot of cases where, uh, you know, where a nobleman decides to, uh, you know, to basically, uh, you know, take his uh, bastard son into the family somehow. OK, so that happens. But there was nothing legally forcing that to happen. So if a child was born out of wedlock, even if everybody knew who the father was, there was no legal obligation on the part of the father. Now, the other thing is Olympe de Gouge felt like that marriage, uh, as it was constituted, was very much against, uh, you know, women. And so what she said, she wrote other marital vows and wrote that, you know, basically a kind of thing, which I think in some ways is sort of refreshing when you think about it. Uh, you know, this idea that, uh, you know, these marital vows that she wrote, they said essentially that, you know, we swear to, uh, you know, to honor each other, be faithful to each other as long as it makes us both happy. So as long as we're happy together, we'll be together. Whereas you take that from the traditional, like, uh, you know, Judeo-Christian mindset, especially a Catholic mindset uh, that divorce, no matter how miserable you are, that that's taboo. I tell you what, um, Emily, I don't know if you've watched uh, Dairy Girls yet. Uh, I tell you, that is um, a... That is hilarious. I, I, I watched it. It's only six episodes. They're 30 minutes. Uh, but that is uh, like that. That is just that's it's hilarious. It's like you got to put the subtitles on because it's really thick Irish accents. But you run into this uh, this whole, you know, they get into this whole idea of divorce and, you know, just in Irish culture because it's so influenced by Roman Catholicism. Uh, but anyway, as far as that goes. Yeah. And so that is. Uh, that, you know, Olympe de Gouge was somebody who brought that out there because it's like this whole idea that people should like two people should continue to stay married, even if they're making each other miserable, um, that from an enlightened perspective, 
that makes absolutely no sense, okay? That people should be together because, you know, think about the Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So, and one thing to note about de Gouge and, um, you know, and Wollstonecraft is they were liberal feminists. Now, there's also a socialist tradition of feminism uh, that grows out of that. Flora Tristan uh, was a French socialist who comes up in DBQs quite a bit. I've seen her in multiple DBQs. Uh, so she was somebody who wrote a lot. But, uh, you know, early on, uh, you know, you've got, uh, you know, this initially this liberal tradition of feminism, which is about basically applying uh, liberalism's promise of equal rights and opportunities to women as well as men. And then, of course, socialist feminism, uh, you know, is another school that I'm not quite as familiar with. But, uh, you know, if you want to look more into Flora Tristan, uh, be my guest. And yes, OK, first wave feminism. Now, first wave feminism, of course, starts with the French Revolution and the, uh, you know, the writings that are coming out with that. Now, remember that it's kind of like when we talk about Jacksonian democracy in AP US history, that there are people like, oh, well, Jackson wasn't very good to minorities and women. He just he just helped the white men. But the thing is, until all the white men could vote, you didn't have a feminist movement in the United States. That goes back to the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848. So once all the men are actually equal, then other people start thinking, well, why can't I get in on this equality? And so as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, uh, you know, they're, uh, you know, when, you know, it's as soon as the French Revolution comes about, you know, Wollstonecraft had written initially the, uh, you know, a vindication of the rights of man before she wrote a vindication of the rights of woman, because, you know, but then, you know, it's just, okay, all the men are equal. Now let's talk about uh, making everybody equal. So yes, that's first wave feminism. Now, first wave feminism is about attaining political rights for women. Okay. It's about political rights, voting rights, uh, you know, and also like things like, you know, child support and that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, just ba these basic rights for women, whereas second wave feminism is post-World War II, and that's going to focus on the economic and social equalities that were still very much present in society in spite of women uh, being allowed to vote in the wake of World War One. All right. And, um, yeah, historical development of socialism prior to Marx, not something that I think you're going to see a whole lot of on the, on the exam and not something I've thoroughly studied, but, you know, it was there. Now, one thing you'll run into in my Revolutions of 1848 in France lecture, I go a little bit into Louis Blanc. Uh, Louis Blanc was a French socialist. Uh, I wouldn't call him a Marxist or a communist, but he was somebody who was mobilizing the working class and trying to get uh, government government aid. Uh, you know, Louis Blanc in the wake of the revolutions of 1848 um, got funding for these national workshops. Um, and these were places where unemployed people could go and they could work and they could get paid by the state. And so really one of the first like, you know, experiments with social welfare programs. Uh, but, um, you know, let's see, utopian socialism is the guy's name Fournier or something like that. Um, Yeah, Four, Four, Fourier, um, let's see, Charles Fourier, okay, so influential, let me go ahead and share this with y'all, um, you know, I don't think we're going to find him on the, um, yeah, so, so as far as that goes, let me, uh, let me, this guy, I've seen this guy mentioned uh, before, not necessarily on exam, but I see him. Uh, yeah, so this guy is one of the founders of utopian socialism. Um, and so as far as that goes, uh, a whole movement. Now, this is kind of like there's a similar thing going on in the United States at the time where they've got these utopian communities um, that are getting started. So, you know, he is influencing like Brook Farm in Massachusetts was influenced by Fourier. And so this was now, and of course, this was not about like Marx said that, you know, socialism is going to happen scientifically, um, you know, and it's just going to happen without any kind of intention. Now, it, these are intentional communities. These people are consciously trying to bring about socialism. And so Marx <coughs> said that basically socialism is going to come when, you know, when it's, when it's, when in the fullness of time, it's ready for it, okay? That it's actually Lenin who 
was, uh, you know, Lenin who modified Marx and said, you know what, the working class, they're naturally not going to come to their senses on their own and they need a revolutionary vanguard to help them out with that. OK, so they need something to help them out with that. And so that's Leninism. OK, Marx thought that was going to happen on its own. So the utopian socialism socialists, it's like they're intentionally trying to bring it about. And it's not starting with the working class. It's starting with a lot of, uh, you know, the intellectual classes and that sort of thing. Um, now, another thing you might want to note is, uh, you know, like anarchism, which is going to become really the dominant form of socialism in the late 19th century. Um, and when you think about like Tsar Alexander II being assassinated, that wasn't by Marxists, that was by anarchists who believed that, uh, you know, a form of uh, a campaign of terror needed to be carried out um, against the governments in order to bring about a socialist, uh, you know, a socialist society. And so then does being a conservative automatically make one religious at this time? That's a really good question. Um, I think that what I would say right off uh, is, you know, you think about somebody like George Washington, for example, like George Washington wasn't someone who was like a bear known as a highly religious man. Like I think when I was at Mount Vernon, I was told that he would leave church before communion. Like he didn't actually take communion. Um, so he wasn't like, uh, you know, like a you know, Bible thumper or anything like that. But in his farewell address, he talks about how, you know, religion is a necessary support for Republican government. So what I would say here is being a conservative at this time, it you may not be the most religious person, uh, but at the same time, you understand that religion as a social influence tends to be conservative. Like when you think about it, like now not every religious person in the United States today is conservative, but as far as, uh, you know, as far as that goes, um, oh, grad school, I didn't know that. Uh, I'll have to hear more about that sometime, Emily. And so as far as, uh, as far as that goes, that you're allied with the interest of religion because, you know, people who are religious, tend to be more conservative than people who aren't religious. Like, you know, irreligious people um, tend to be, like, on a whole, less conservative. Now, I've met some very conservative, uh, you know, atheists and agnostics, but it's not necessarily the norm. But I think at this time, uh, you know, it's like liberals, uh, you know, are threatening this social fabric, you know, that the church has been a part of, you know, the church, the nobility, like basically these traditional institutions and traditional sources of authority. So, yeah, I do think that a conservative um, you know, is at this time, like the Holy Alliance, like not only were they trying to stop rebellions, but the reason they call it the Holy Alliance is they were uh, concerned about the day, what they saw as the dangers of secularism and an increasingly uh, secularizing society. All right. Well, uh, wow, Emily, you kept me, uh, kept me going tonight. And yeah, I'll have to hear more about this, uh, these graduate studies of yours uh, sometime at your convenience. Uh, so as far as that goes, ladies and gentlemen, we will be back here. Now, remember, um, Fiveable went uh, for a little bit. Uh, you know, Fiveable went members only. And it looks like, you know, it's a first year company. They're constantly reevaluating uh, their mission. Uh, these are for the foreseeable future going to be public, uh, you know, at least now I can't vouch for, you know, right before the exam when it may, you know, it may be, you know, back to a members only thing. But I would say at least through uh, mid April, I would expect these to remain public. So, uh, you know, keep that in mind. Tell your friends about it if you're finding these helpful and let's get some people in here. All right, ladies and gentlemen. And again, thank you all for coming tonight. I'll see you next week to talk about the Industrial Revolution and other topics. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, Emily. I owe you one. And uh, yes, yes, very welcome, Jillian. Good to hear from you.